Hello, my name is Wendell Boucher. It's the 12th of August, 2016. The title for this presentation, as you can see, is LLC Resident Power Converter Design. Getting started. You have to start somewhere. We will be focusing on these topics. Number one, right here, showing a method that quickly and accurately plots power output versus control frequency using real circuits operating in the time domain. FHA, or Fundamental Harmonic Analysis, is an approximation of the real circuit, and therefore not nearly as accurate as the method you will see demonstrated here. Number two, how to quickly establish the value of the LLC resonant components in order to fit the power versus frequency curve within a specified frequency range. This is done by choosing a capacitor value, namely the resonant capacitor value, and modifying parameter values until we fit the curve. Number three, having come up with the parts values we need, we will close the feedback loop and speak a little about the LLC power stage gain and phase and also the closed loop gain and phase, of course. At number four, you will see a comparison of power versus frequency data calculated by three independent software programs. The worst case difference between this data is actually 0.2%, which is very, very accurate. This is important. This video, like my others, cannot possibly cover all aspects of the design issues. There is simply not enough time, particularly in a video that's just an hour long or so, as I'm sure this one will be. However, they are intended to introduce design methods that make maximum use of a computer-aided technology, mainly for the purpose of achieving more predictable designs in a shorter time. Now before we get started, I think you'll be interested in what you see here on the page right now. We will be using three software programs, actually four, but three we're doing calculations. I'll show the performance of the LLC circuit we are designing and they show it very accurately. However, there is a considerable difference in their speed of execution. The three programs are the simplest circuit analysis program that plots the load power curves as a function of three line voltages. This is how we start the design, namely low line, nominal line, and high line. Execution clock time to do this is about 22 seconds. That means looking at your watch, it takes about 22 seconds. Another program is an LT SPICE circuit analysis program, a very popular one because it's free, of the actual LLC circuit with the loop closed. That can be run at the same three line voltages, namely low line, nominal line, and high line. The execution time for the LT SPICE program to do the same thing that this one does takes about 162 seconds or almost three minutes. Now, number three, this is different from these two. This is a state variable LLC design program that uses my state variable technique. And it yields with each run much more formatted performance data than do the circuit analysis programs. It is the most accurate method to use. Execution speed of this program is just 0 0.0293 seconds. Now compared to this program, which is relatively fast, we have 22 divided by 0 0.0293. And this program is 700 times faster than this one. We compare it to this one, 
62 divided by point oh two nine three. Doing this on my calculator, by the way. It's f more than fifty five hundred times or five thousand five hundred times faster than this is. When I want to do real serious work, I do it this way to start. Now here we show a schematic of the LLC. It's an LT SPICE schematic. You probably recognize it. Our design goal is to produce 300 watts at 48 volts DC out. 48 volts DC here. Across this resistor, 300 watts. Now the DC line, this is a half bridge uh, LLC. DC line is really here, that's the line voltage. For these DC line voltages, high line, nominal line, low line, we see an equivalent DC half bridge voltage, that's the voltage that appears here when these switches open and close. The voltage there is half of this, or 215, 193, and 170. What we really do to design this is to set this value of CR. We've already done that. You can see it's a 0.01 microfarad. And then we solve for LR, LM as a set V mag as a parameter. You'll see that in just a moment. Don't have to remember it. And I've noted that as we move these parameters, call CR, we fix that, but we still can move it, or F resonant, I haven't described that one to you, but I will, we move either one of these parameters, the frequency of the curves go up, power goes up, as we move M upward, we see the frequency going down, that we're operating at, we see the power going down. As we move V mag up, the frequency always goes down, but the power, depending on where you are on the curve, can either go up or down. It's a strange parameter. But for the circuits we're working on, it always goes down. All right. Now first I'll cover this. There are many good papers on the web that cover LLC design, as I'm sure you know. And there are two that I particularly like, namely because they get right to the point and are easy reading. They're not page after page of mathematics. They are Infinian application note, here's the number, written by Sam Abdel Rahman. This was sent to me by a good friend and former colleague. It's a paper he uses too. And another paper noted below and written by Bo Yang. I believe he's a graduate of Virginia Tech and he writes a lot of papers about resonant converters. Here's his name right here. And if you type this entire expression right here, chapter 6, small signal analysis of LLC resonant converters. You'll fetch that paper on the web, no problem. Now we got that over with, let's look at the curves. You're going to see when we run a program that you'll see curves that look like this. This axis is the load power in watts. You can see this, this curve goes up to uh, 750 watts. At low line, this is low line, this is a medium line voltage, high line voltage. Now we want to realize at least 300 watts and all three of these curves give us 300 watts of course so it's a good design. We could optimize a little bit more I might add. Now there are regions, this is very important. Region 1 is from the resident frequency 
and that's this one for this design we set it at 140 kilohertz but that's a parameter that we can set called FRES now region there are three regions region 2 is the most desirable in fact it's probably the only one you should operate in it is the region between two frequencies the lower frequency being where the power peaks so if it's your low line here's the peak for low line so it's between here and here between the peak and between 140 kilohertz and it's only 140 kilohertz in this case because we set resonant frequency 240 kilohertz let me go back and show you something up here see this inductor called LR there's also an inductor called LM or L magnetizing and CR it's called the resonant capacitor the resonant inductor that's what the R stands for the frequency at which this capacitor and this inductor resonate is called F resonant for me in this presentation I may have that down here somewhere no I don't anyway it's called FR I should say FRES I'm sorry apologize FRES is the frequency of resonance for this component and this component in series now get back to the curve what we want to do is design the power supply to achieve the power and we want to in this case I put it down as a specification operate between 75 kilohertz which is here see that pointer moving 75 kilohertz and 140 kilohertz now where are we actually going to operate see how the shape looks very slow going up very fast coming down we want to operate in this region this is number two again from the peak to F res we're going to show you how you do that now here you see a simplest program this is the schematic of the so-called power stage there is no feedback loop because we don't need one what we're going to be doing is plotting power versus frequency you can see some parameters down here they're called dot VAR in this program and they really mean dot PARAM in P spice for example for LT spice they're parameters VMAG is one of them it's set at 300 volts CR is another one we set that at 0.01 I'll tell you why in just a minute VDC is 193 that's the this voltage right here which is the line voltage for half bridge at nominal line it's half of this one this is the nominal line voltage before you hit the bridge and M right now is 3 could be any number I put some information over here it says start at 6 but I ended up at 3 because these are variables and here's FRES at 140 kilohertz now let's go back and look at the curve just for a minute one of the reasons for that at 140 kilohertz is if you were actually operating there you would find that no matter what the load resistor is you wouldn't have to change the frequency that's one of the meanings but the real reason we operate below the resonant frequency is this when in that region, meaning region 2, we achieve zero voltage switching. That means the switch turns on at zero voltage. And we generate a haversine of current through the rectifier diodes. This is very important. In region number 1, if we were to operate, say, over here, the currents are clipped, and this will produce more rectifier loss so it's desirable to work in this region just keep that in mind uh, where are we? back
back here again. <clears throat> now we're going to go back and run this program for you. There it is. Here's an example of the values. In fact, it's the values we're using. That's good. And some instructions right here. But here's the manual. We're going to run this program right now. We're simply going to run it by clicking on the run command. We're going to run it with these values because VDC is a parameter. We can change that. So let's just run it. You see the curves coming up here. We're finished. That was very fast. Now we want to operate here, of course, at 300 watts on this side. Now let's do something else. Simulator. Set up multi-step. It's already been done, but I wanted to show it to you. There's VDC. Define a list, and you can see here are the operating voltages, and they came from here, of course. 170 low line, nominal line, high line. That's all done, so we can close it. We'll close this too. Now let's run multi step. This takes 22 seconds to run. Almost finished. Now this is actually a finished design, but let's say, for the heck of it, we wanted to move this curve down to 100. Can we do that? Sure. First, let's just look at the curve. We just, well, we have to set the voltage to low line down here, which is 170. And we'll simply run it. And we're done, and you can see where we are, but let's expand that. Let's do something like this and expand it. Here's the line at 300 watts. Oh, by the way, I want to bring up something. The way this program operates, and I can't change the labels without doing a lot of work, so it doesn't bother me doing it this way. This axis, even you can see a V over here, it really is a voltage in the program. But for the circuit, it's actually wattage. 280, 290 watts, 295, 300, that's the one we want. And down here, you'll see time in milliseconds. It isn't really milliseconds, it's in the real problem. It's 98 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz, 102 kilohertz, 104 kilohertz. So keep that in mind. These numbers are always the frequency in kilohertz. So we're over here, we'd like to move it down here. Let's go back and look at the directions I gave you before. There they are. Now we can, we want to move the frequency down, so only these two things will do it. I don't really want to change this one because M is a better one to change, because M affects other things as well. Although in this case it would actually do the same thing. But I'm going to leave that alone and change M. So let's go back to the program, and you see M3. Now if M goes up, frequency goes down, so let's make that 2. M is now 2, down here. We're going to run another curve. Simulator run. must be too low. Probably is. Go back and look at it. Yep, sure is. Now let's move the... Let's do that again with M equals 3, which is where we were. Be there in just a sec. Here we are. I want to look at 100. There it is. Here's where we want to put it. 
So let's see what we're supposed to do here. M wants to go up. Okay, not down, went the wrong way. Let's go back. I'll make it 3.2. Here's where we were. We're going to run it. See, we have a new curve right here. Here's the old curve. Here's the new one. But we're not at 100. Let's try 3.3. We're running it at 3, with an M of 3.3 .3 now. Was well, just 3. Now we're here. It doesn't look too bad. Almost there. Back to expanding it. I mean, the frequency is now 99. Uh, take a look down here in this corner. I'm moving this, this corner. You should be able to see this. The numbers are very small. And by the way, you want to run this on high density on YouTube. But let's see what the frequency is. It's 99.879. That's close enough to uh, 100 to be used. Now we'll expand this again. Do we still have enough power? Uh, and it's the one on the inside. Yeah, we have 450 watts at peak. The most we could possibly get out of this. And we're running 300 watts here. And what we'd like is a little guard band in here little distance. We don't, want, we don't want to operate right there. We could put a little hiccup in the circuit. We'll be able to go around that loop, around that uh, point. We don't want to do it. So we'll operate where we are. And now let's go back and run multi-step. We could say this is a new design, for example. I notice we're doing all this without building anything. We're calculating it. Here we are. Here's the new numbers. We're at 100 for 300 watts. Roughly uh, 105 kilohertz. We're in 300 watts at nominal line. And at high line we have to operate at about 111 kilohertz. So we've accomplished that task. I just wanted to show you it's easy to do. We're going to bring this back to 3 now because all of my calculations are based on that. Now let's close down this window and do that again. We should be back where we were on multi-step. And you can see that we are here in the original curves again, the ones that agree with this one. Okay. Yeah, let's stay on this one. Okay. Now, at this point, we could say we have a design that we think works. We're kind of missing something here. We know CR. Now I'm going to explain to you why CR is something that we input. And that's because this value, this inductor, the value of magnetizing inductance can be just about any value that's realizable. Doesn't cost us any extra to do that. However, this value is a fixed value and comes in certain sizes. For example, 0.01 microfarad, 0.022 microfarad, 0.033 microfarad, 0.047 microfarad, and so on. You really can't buy this capacitor if it were 
0.1632 microfarads. Therefore, I thought it wise to pick this number first. Instead of using the Q parameter, which this is dependent upon, we simply pick this number and calculate these two. Now, you note this note here, component values are in the simplest netlist after pre-processing. So how do we see those values? Well, here's the simplest command window, so to speak. Click on simplest. You click on edit netlist after pre-process or after processing. Click on that. And you see this commit? This is a netlist program which should have been generated because the software looked at all of this and generated the netlist. So what do we want? We want two values and I'll tell you what they are. One is L2 and one is L1. LR is really L1 in the circuit. LM is really L2 in the circuit. These are the circuit values. So we look at this, we see L1 is actually, actually equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 129.2346938777 and so forth microamperes. 129 is close enough. So we called it, not here, but in the next program you see, we'll call it 129 microamperes. L2 is the magnetizing inductance. And that's 258 microamperes. Okay, but that's how we got the values. I'm going to shut that down. Click on here, and that'll go back to the background. Let's bring up another schematic. This one is a closed loop LLC using symmetrics again. And you see what we're really designing to is a 386-volt DC average input, nominal input, plus or minus 10 percent. It's actually about 11. 48 volts DC out to 300 watts. Now, now we get some more calculated values, but the ones we calculated before are now solid values. And I'll bring you up to show you. You can see. The CR resonance of 0 0.01 we selected. We calculated this one, 129 micro. And we're going to click on this, edit part, and you can see 259 micro right here. This is the actual value. What you see here is just a note. I think I'm going to edit like this. Okay. Let's bring it back down to normal size again so you can see it all. Here we go. Now, this is a power stage, like the one we had before, but this time we have an actual load on it. We have a load capacitor, and by the way, this is a could be ac actually done because this is four wet, four solid dry tantalums in parallel, each of which has 0.1 ohms ESR. So for the four of them, we have 400 mics. 25 milliohms. Here's the load resistor that we need for 300 watts at 48 volts here. This is the feedback loop. Have the sensing resistors. We go into a type 3 compensation amplifier effect right, right here. I'll tell you why in a moment we need a type 3. We come out of the type 3 and we go into a chip, if you will that converts the voltage to a frequency at this point. Now down here we've added a little more circuitry so we can show you something. We're picking up the voltage that generates the frequency. We set it up so one volt gives us 50 kilohertz as seen at the transformer primary winding as seen right here. Now it's a little bit noisy because we have signal coming back, we have ripple coming back this way of course a real power supply design. And so we filter it out with a two-stage filter and look at it here, which is the average. I'll show you that in a minute. So let's run this. 
Now we have three analysis types, POP, transient, and AC. Now if we're working, working in the POP analysis, and what does that mean? It means periodic operating point, or to you and I, it probably means more, we call it steady state operation. That's the point at which the currents and voltages are not changing anymore. And, and that's called a pop analysis. Because you have to be at that point to do an AC analysis. But I want to show you something. This is checked and it says use snapshot from previous transient analysis. Now what that's for is if you have any problem doing a pop analysis or an AC analysis, if you've done a transient analysis, it simply remembers all the voltages and currents associated with this circuit. And that's very, very valuable. So we'll run the transient analysis first. I think the pop would work, but we'll try that first. Transient analysis. The number of points for plotting are 500,000. Do we run it? And we're almost done. This is a very fast program also. Now we want to regulate at uh, 48 volts. That's where we are. Right here. Now if we want to do a pop analysis. We can do that next by choosing the analysis. We can do a pop analysis. We can do that next. This is a, a steady state analysis. Let's run it. That happens very quickly. And here we are. Here's the 48 volts we're regulating to. Want to look at that RMS voltage. Let's do it here. 48.000064. That's pretty close. Regulation is very tight. Or we can look at other voltages, and you do that by right-clicking, left-clicking. For example, here's the voltage out of the op-amp. It's about 1.82 volts, not moving that much. Here's the voltage that shows what frequency we're set at. And we can read that. We want to average on this one, so we average it. We're at 108.57 kilohertz. We're at nominal line, and that's what we calculated actually, 108.6 or so. That's pretty good. Now, we can look at other waveforms. Well, let's look at this one up here, for example. VMAG, we want 300 volts, and there we are. There's the 300 volts. See? And I'll tell you. If I don't forget it, I'll tell you how to design this transfer returns ratio. That's what VMAG is for. But let's do something else now. Simulator, choose analysis. We know the pop works, so let's go into AC. AC analysis. And we're at nominal line because let's look at the mega. Okay, we're at AC analysis. Let's move this up a little bit. Here are our variables when we're closing a loop. Let's look at this. VDC, of course, is the line voltage. That's nominal line. Rn is a parameter. And that's the value of this resistor right here. Called Rn. SV is a parameter. It has to do with the inverse of the gain. I think I'll demonstrate that to you in a moment. FC is the crossover frequency, but we cross over where the parts tell us to. We'd like it to be that value. It helps to set that in the end. We have a zero, another zero, and two poles we can adjust. The zeros are set at one kilohertz, two kilohertz, and the poles are both set at 100 kilohertz. So let's look at the loop. I had set up already. Yes, I did. So we'll run it. This first part is setting up the voltages. In a moment, we'll see the loop. There we go. 
Now, we don't want to see the cathode voltage. The reason we saw it before, because we have a probe there. Now with this software, you don't have to put probes anywhere, but sometimes it's convenient. In this case, it's inconvenient, because you can click anywhere, as you saw before, and look at voltages. Let's get rid of that one. You click on that, curves, delete the curve. Now we have just the phase and gain of the feedback loop, and there we are. That's how it looks. And it's measured the same way you do it in real life. A generator inserts a voltage between the control point, which is this point, and the system you're driving, which is this. And you can see it's pretty well behaved. We're crossing over about here at 4.6 kilohertz, roughly. You can see it down here. And the phase of crossover is 80 degrees. That's very good. I want you to notice something about this. You see this gain curve coming down? Oh, by the way, this says dB. It's also phase in degrees. I can put labels there, but I'm not going to bother. And this frequency in hertz, of course, and you can see it's uh, this is in in uh, like one kilohertz, two hertz, definitely in hertz. And this is in degrees. This is degree one. This is phase. This is gain. And for example, 80 means 80 dB plus also means 80 degrees. We'd like the difference in here to be at least 45 degrees. We'd like to see the difference down here. This is called the gain margin. Between 0 degrees and whatever we have for gain, you can see it's roughly 16 dB, minus 16 dB, right about in here, which is very good. So we have a good loop. Now, I wanted to show you this. See this straight line? You see it kind of rises a little bit right here? A little hard to see in this one, but in some of them, it will rise way up like this, come back down again. At the same time, this rises, this phase dips. Now, when you have a real zero, when the gain goes up, so does the phase. We have a right half plane zero, it goes the opposite way. So we have a right half plane zero in the power stage. What do we do about that? Um, Bo Yang talks about it at length in his paper. I want to read that. But he uh, basically says, if you want to move it out of this range that we're operating in for, for the closed loop, then you in increase the resonant frequency so that it's outside of this loop. Well, well, it's always outside anyway, of course. But so it's way outside the loop. Like, instead of in this case, using 140 kilohertz, we might use 200 kilohertz. But it's not a problem, as you can see, for this design, this specific design. Now, let's look at something else. Let's look at the power stage itself, all by itself. We we'll look at dB, relative voltage. This is called V out. This is called V in, or V control. V control is usually the uh, the, the output of the compensation amplifier. But since we have a generator, we have to look here. So there it is. That looks like a simple pole, but it isn't. In fact, if you look at the change in dB for one decade, like 1 kilohertz to 10 kilohertz, you see it's about 40 dB. Which means we have a pole pair into a complex pole pair. Now over here we have a zero coming in here someplace. I didn't really calculate it, but it's really caused by the ESR of this, which produces a zero in the power stage. And you can see evidence of that right here. Now as I said, we have a soft start, 
or our means of measuring frequency right here, but it's produced by this soft start. I'm going to do a tranche analysis again. We're doing it at normal line again. Run. Okay. And you can see we're at 48 volts. Now let's look at something else. Let's look at this point. Excuse me. This point right here. This is the frequency. You can see it starts at a high frequency. This is in kilohertz. Right here, frequency in kilohertz. It's actually a voltage, but it's a frequency in kilohertz. Starts at a high frequency, comes down, steady states over here. So that finally at steady state, we see this frequency. You can see it's uh, roughly 108.6 or so. 108.6. Another way to look at that frequency. Going to pop analysis. A run. Look at this voltage. And we'll look at the average of it up here. 108.57, same number we got before, or pretty close to it. I said 108.6 kilohertz. So you see there's several ways of making measurements with this tool. Now, go back and see what we've accomplished. We were showing you a method. We showed you that method that quickly and accurately plots power output versus control frequency. We've shown you this as well. And now we're talking about this one, how to close the feedback loops. Now we're going to show you a comparison of power versus frequency data collected by three independent software programs. And I'll show you the three. You've seen the programs already, but I'll show you again. The worst case difference is only 0.2%. That's very, very good. Now, go back and look at this one. The frequency we measure here, as I just showed you, And in this one, we can measure the frequency by doing this. It's not a very convenient way, but let's do it. Let's, uh, in fact, just do one run. <coughs> feeling we're not at the right. Let's look at that again. Yeah, we're at low line. Let's move it into nominal line. 193 volts. Run again. Now we're at 300. Here's the frequency. It says 108.909. It's within four tenths of a kilohertz. What we calculated before. Now, before we spoke about the Haversign right here. Spoke about this Haversign. So let's show that to you. And we see it here. No, we won't see it with this one. We might see it with this one, but I know we'll see it with the other one. This one will definitely see it. So we're running at nominal line again. And here we go. And we're doing a pop analysis. So let's do this. Let's look at the voltage across this diode. We 
do that by looking at this voltage differential. Here's the voltage. Kind of strange looking, but you can see it's uh, that's the voltage across the diode. This is the forward drop right here. Now let's look at the current for the diode. And let's look at just one of these. See what's happening? This is the voltage across the diode. It's turned on here. And it's turned off here. If you'll notice, this curve is always within the voltage. That means the current is gone before it, the diode reverses. So the losses are very low. Now, if we were to operate in region number one, you would see this curve going up straight. As uh, well, as straight as you can see, it's a half a sine, half a sine. But about here, depending on how far to the right you were, you'd see it drop down suddenly, just like this, very suddenly, and there'd be a spike of loss at that point. Now, we're going to bring up another program for you. Here you see an LT SPICE program, which also has that feature in it to me measure frequency. And we're going to run this. We're going to change this. Um, this to a comment instead of a primer because it'll otherwise it'll take three minutes to run. We'll just run it at let's look at some of this. We wanted to run all of these line voltages. We turn this back into a direction a directive. Otherwise we're just gonna run three eighty six. 386 is our nominal line. So let's do that. Simulate, run. It started. And here it comes up. This is the slowest program. It does the job, but it's very slow. same time, let's take a look at this frequency. There it is. Starts off at about 250 kilohertz, as I recall. Drops down to steady state as this goes into steady state. And if we look at that frequency, Hundred and eight point five. Where have you heard that number before? It was hundred and eight point four point five and so on. This is how we measured the frequency. And this is a closed loop. We're not forcing that frequency. The system is. The loop makes that happen. Now again, let's take a look at that diode voltage. First I'm going to turn these off. And we look, same diode, we look at the voltage across it. We do it this way. And look at the current through it. And we'll look at a piece of that. Now there's a difference, you notice. The shape is sort of the same down through here. Actually, it's a line going this way. But you notice all this ringing? This is a real circuit now. In the simplest circuit, I had an ideal diode. Here I have a real one. The real one has capacitance. And when you turn diodes on and off, the capacitor rings. There are ways to resonate that capacitance, but they're seldom used just adds more expense. 
but regardless of the ringing, the envelope of the current is still within is still within the envelope of the voltage, and it, it's at zero before the voltage turns off. So we still have the same property, good property of the diode. Okay. By the way, the efficiency of this LLC right now is 97.41%. That includes the losses for the vent switches. They're simple, but they but the real FET switches give you about the same loss within a few percent. It just takes a lot longer to calculate. Most of the loss is right over here in the diodes. In fact, I'll show you one. Do it this way. And there's the loss. Let's do this. See all this hash on here? This is part of the way LT Spice works. And some of it's real. But we're going to look at the average of this and see. The loss for the diode is 1.58 something watts. 1.58 watts. And if we look at the loss for the switch, let's take a look at one of those. It's only 0 0.461 watts. It's around. It's between 0.46 and 0.56 in reality. Now, since this is so small and this is so large, it's all. Oops, it's rather obvious that we can raise this efficiency of 98 something if we use synchronous diodes at this point. Diode drop is simply too much, especially at 48 volts. So this, this has the capability of giving us efficiency at maximum load of probably 98 plus percent, which is very good. Okay. Now finally, we told you we had very high accuracy. We'll show you the actual numbers. Three different software tools were used to measure operating frequency at a constant load power of 300 watts. The closed loops or even open loops set as, as power loop. All three different calculation and methods of measurement compare within a worst case difference of just 0.2 percent. Actually it's a little less than that. Obviously the final design of this LLC has not been completed. This is why we call this the beginning or, as I said up here, just getting started. We finished quite a lot, actually. Please note that the maximum use of computer-aided technology does not, does practically guarantee that production yields will be very high with few, if any, design issues. Now, here are the here's just exact data, data, data that I took to um, at least five places. I probably couldn't repeat this place if I took it again, but I'd be close. It might be a couple of digits off. Here are the DC line voltages. Frequency calculated using LLC. This is the state variable program, which is very, very accurate. I could make these numbers as accurate as 0.05% if I wanted to, using state variables. This, however, is the accuracy of the program as written by the writers, so I'm never quite sure. But you can see we compare very nicely. 5 to 7, 1 to 8, 1 to 6, 16 to 32. This is the one that's off the most. Not very bad though, till 103 kilohertz. And this is the LT Spice program. They also agree quite well. So I took the worst case of all of these and looked at it over here. And it's at 
that end and at this end, the center, it's very close. So that's how clo close we can calculate power versus frequency. Okay, I think we're finished. I believe I've covered everything that I wanted to. Oh, one more thing. Here we go. I want to know what VMAG is for. The reason I use VMAG instead of working at VLOAD is because if you work at VLOAD, you have to have a transfer ratio in the program somewhere. Or know what this voltage is. That's rather annoying because we haven't designed the transformer yet. But if we know VMAG, and we know V-load, now, now, now we can calculate the turns ratio between end primary and end secondary. And here it is. It's as simple as this. V-load divided by V-mag is end secondary 1 over end primary. Now, in the case of using LT-spice, they don't do a turns ratio. Simplest does, but spice doesn't. LT-spice wants an inductor here, and an inductor value here, inductor value is here. So we'll call it an inductor value LS1, this one. It's equal to LM, which is this value, times the square of the turns ratio, NS1 divided by NP, NS1 divided by NP. And that's the value to use over here in LT spice. Now we're finished. This has taken almost an hour to do, so I'll leave you this thought. If you have any questions concerning this video, I can be reached on YouTube, of course. And my email is wendell.boucher, this is my name, at comcast.net. My phone number is 571-364-8303, and I live in Bristol, Virginia, in the United States. So thank you for watching this. I would appreciate your feedback and comments. They'll help me to make my videos much better, I'm sure. So goodbye.